Well, hello, everybody. Um, it's wonderful to welcome you to the fifth of the HMI DES seminars. Um, today, we've got Assistant Professor Barbara Kiviak from Stanford. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the fact that I live on um, Narago lands and I work on Narago lands and paying my respects to um, the traditional custodians of country um, throughout Australia, um, especially their elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, so, Barbara is joining us now from Stanford. Um, she's an assistant professor there of sociology. Um, I met Barbara when we were having some, doing a conference with the Human Centered AI Institute last year. Um, and uh, she's one of those, uh, those rare creatures who has spent time with philosophers and, um, and is keen to spend more time with philosophers. So that's a, a wonderful thing to have experienced. Um, and uh, I work on the um, kind of moral limits of credit scoring um, uh, and credit kind of scoring practices. Um, has received significant recognition um, in sociology and uh, has wonderful connections through to several different um, HMI themes. Um, so Barbara is going to be talking about the moral legibility of narrative and case comparison. So as usual, we'll keep the, the intro short and go straight over to you, Barbara, if you'd like to get started and share your screen. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Does that look good? Can I get a thumbs up? Great. Okay. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Seth. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, what I'm going to present today is brand new, so I really look forward to your feedback. Please don't pull any punches in the Q&A because I want to turn this into something, something good. Um, so I'm an economic sociologist, and a lot of what I study is how different groups of people have competing ideas about what fairness means in market settings. I'm particularly interested in cases where companies use personal data to make predictions about how individuals will behave and then give them different things as a result. I'm going to start today with an example of this. About 25 years ago, Car insurance companies in the US began using consumer credit scores to set prices for car insurance policies. As it turns out, credit scores are great at predicting who will file insurance claims and thus cost companies money. Now, credit scoring, I should make clear, is an example of algorithmic prediction. Data from a lot of different people's credit files are used to make predictions about how particular individuals will behave. People with low credit scores are more likely to file insurance claims, so car insurers charge them higher prices. When regulators and legislators found out the companies were doing this, they did not react kindly. Credit-based insurance scores, as the scores are known, have been the subject of intense scrutiny, including five congressional hearings, 17 investigations, or rather at least 17 investigations, investigations in at least 17 different states. In the US, insurance is regulated largely at the state level. Uh, and four major reviews by the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, which is the professional association of insurance regulators in the US. Dozens of states, practically all states, have passed laws restricting how car insurance companies can use credit scores. For our purposes, what's interesting is that these debates have largely been about whether or not these scores are fair. One of those congressional hearings, for example, was titled simply, Credit-Based Insurance Scores, Are They Fair? I have an entire paper about this debate. Here it is, I highly recommend it. But today I'm going to jump to the punchline because what I really wanna talk about is where this case is leading me next. In a nutshell, the debate over credit-based insurance scores pitted two different conceptions of market fairness against each other, actuarial fairness and moral deservingness. In the case of actuarial fairness, insurance companies said, if it predicts, it's fair. That is to say, credit scores are correlated with insurance outcomes and therefore they're legitimate to use. If you work in algorithmic fairness, Predictive validity as a moral claim is probably something you've come across before. In the US, this concept of fairness is actually pretty well institutionalized in insurance law and regulation. Now, policymakers, legislators and regulators did care about predictive validity, but it wasn't all they cared about. 
policymakers also got really hung up on two questions. The policymakers asked, why do credit scores predict insurance claims? And why do some people have low scores in the first place? Again, if you work in algorithmic fairness, this probably feels familiar. People are constantly asking why data and predictions work the way they do. People eternally seek explanations, accounts, stories, causal narratives, and so on. In this case, the reason policymakers wanted to know why, I argue, is because they were pulling from a second moral framework one that holds that people ought to get what they deserve. By deservingness, I mean that the goodness or badness of a person's past actions indicates what they ought to receive. So for example, policymakers didn't like the fact that a person could get really sick, wreck their credit when they couldn't pay off tens of thousands of dollars in medical bills, and then see their car insurance rates go up as a result. In that situation, they didn't think people deserved higher prices. Importantly, the tool policymakers used to adjudicate whether people were getting what they deserved was narrative. Policymakers searched for stories about why scores predicted claims and why people had low scores. And depending on what that story was, policymakers judged the use of credit scores as either fair or unfair. Some stories passed moral muster and others didn't. So what happened in terms of public policy is that legislators and regulators created all of these exceptions in law and regulation. Times when people might have low credit scores, but they nonetheless shouldn't get higher insurance prices. Part of this was about life events outside of people's control. For example, if drivers had low scores because they'd been ill or laid off from a job, or displaced due to natural disaster. But a lot of it was also about what I think of as morally laudable behavior. Things that people could control, but which nonetheless shouldn't lead to higher insurance prices. For instance, one situation that came up time and again was that some people had low credit scores because they'd never borrowed money in the first place. I'll share just one quote on this from a Michigan state legislator who was testifying at a hearing in that state. My grandfather and grandmother, he said, they paid by cash for everything. They did not have a lengthy credit report. Now, is it fair to say that they have to pay higher rates because they're not using credit cards or they're not taking out loans? That's absolutely absurd. Here, the point is that people can have low credit scores because they virtuously don't take on debt. Rather than leveraging to the hilt, some people save their money before buying things, what's unfair then is the market punishing them for this good behavior. So what legislators and regulators did was write all these exceptions into law and regulation. For example, one said, your insurance rates can't go up just because you don't happen to have a credit score, just because you're invisible to the credit bureau. Okay then, to return to this, what I wanna argue, and now we're stepping beyond that original paper into my new work is that each of these moral arguments about actuarial fairness and moral deservingness depends on a particular way of organizing cognition. What do I mean by way of organizing cognition? Well, I'm going to argue that actuarial fairness depends on viewing people as cases and thinking in terms of case comparison while moral deservingness depends on viewing people as actors in series of unfolding events and thinking in terms of narrative. What I'm going to take from credit-based insurance scoring then is that algorithmic prediction, which mechanically requires that we view people as cases and think in terms of case comparison, is conducive to some sorts of moral evaluation, but not to others. So here's an overview of the argument I'm going to make today. First, case comparison and narrative represent distinct ways of organizing cognition. More on that in a moment. Second, each way of organizing cognition makes various features of people more or less legible. Third, this difference in legibility makes various moral standards more or less easy to adjudicate. That's because different moral standards require different sorts of information about people. 
And fourth, this has bearing on algorithmic fairness because algorithms necessarily work through case comparison. Some types of unfairness are harder to think in given the form information takes. Okay, to start at the top of the list, what does it mean for case comparison and narrative to organize cognition differently? Let me start with an example from the work of sociologist Carol Heimer, who in the 1980s and 90s spent a lot of time in neonatal intensive care units. One of Heimer's observations was that doctors and parents come to understand sick infants quite differently. I guess that was mean to show you a picture of a baby and then to tell you it's meant to be a sick baby. Sorry, I didn't mean to be a doctor. Uh, it's a really amazing article. Um, so when doctors are presented with a new sick infant, they view the baby as a case, as an entity with a series of attributes, which helps slot it into a particular category or set of categories. Doctors abstract away from the particulars of the child before them so that they can better compare this child to all the other sick children they've seen. Through this process of comparison across cases, doctors make determinations about how ill the child is, what its prognosis is, and what action to take. Parents, on the other hand, have often never encountered another seriously ill infant in their lives. Yet what they have is intimate knowledge of their own child. Parents are often with that child around the clock. So there is an intensive rather than extensive knowledge. For parents, the key to making sense of the child and its health is to observe change over time. Parents watch a child live its life hour by hour, day by day, and they capture all the rich contextual detail that goes with that. Heimer refers to this as organizing cognition through biological narrative. I'm going to refer to it simply as narrative. Now this distinction, which is essentially the difference between thinking in categories and thinking in stories, shows up across disciplines. Here's my distillation of some of the main differences that occur when we think about people as cases with attributes versus as actors in unfolding narratives. At the bottom of the slide are some of the sources I drew on in constructing this chart, which takes a lot of inspiration from a 2001 article by Carol Heimer. Let's start at the top. Context and circumstance. When we think about people as cases with particular attributes, we strip away a lot of the particulars. This isn't incidental. Simplifying people or any other entities is what makes them comparable. As many scholars have observed, this sort of flattening is necessary for collecting information at scale, running bureaucracies, and conducting statistical analysis. Narrative, on the other hand, not only preserves context and circumstance, but relies on it. Stories, for example, have settings. That's part of what it means to be a story. Narrative is a thick form of information that goes hand in hand with conveying particulars. Similarly, people's mental states, their emotions, intentions, and so forth, fade to the background when we render people as cases. Yet again, these details are often crucial components of narrative. A story likely includes what happened, but also whether it's what a person meant to happen and how they felt about events having transpired in that way. Narrative, for example, can include things like remorse and contrition. This next one is perhaps counterintuitive. When we render people as cases, we decide in advance what sorts of information are important. We decide which attributes matter, and then we collect those attributes. But that's not how narrative works. With narratives, we often don't know what the telling features are until we get to the end of the story. It's often only after we know how things turned out that we can look back and truly understand what was significant. More intuitive, perhaps, is that cases are atemporal. All the information is available simultaneously. Narrative, on the other hand, runs chronologically. One thing happens, and then the next. And that ordering is important. Stories mean different things depending on the sequencing of events. Getting drunk and then into a car accident means something different than getting into a car accident and then drunk. Cases typically obscure the role of other people. The information we have about a person is generally understood as about that person. Yet in narrative, other characters often play key roles, so we can much more easily interpret events as related to the networks in which people are embedded, families, communities, workplaces, and so on. 
And finally, the last two, which I've included because I think they're particularly relevant for algorithmic fairness. First, rendering people as cases and manipulating those cases with algorithms, as algorithms do, goes with a particular mathematical understanding of causality. If you're drawing a DAG, one of those directed acyclic diagrams, then you're relying on people as cases. If on the other hand, you're thinking theoretically in generalizable terms about how the world works, your approach to causality, I argue, is almost certainly narrative. But in articulating how one thing causes another, you almost necessarily default to a story. And finally, how we get to better predictions. If people are cases and we want to know more about people, then we add more cases. If on the other hand, people are actors in unfolding narratives and we want to know more about people, then we add more details to those narratives. So for example, as the years go by, I get better at predicting how my husband will react to new situations not because I've gone out and collected a larger sample of husbands, but because I've spent more time observing the one I've got. Okay, so that was a lot. What does it all add up to? It all adds up to this. Depending on whether we render people as cases with attributes or as actors in unfolding narratives makes different aspects of those people legible, more visible. And now transitioning back to what I started with, competing notions of fairness, I argue that these differences in legibility mean that some notions of fairness are easier to adjudicate when we render people as cases and other notions of fairness are easier to adjudicate when we render people in narrative. So now in a way to switch gears, but it'll all come back together. Here are four notions of justice slash injustice. Desert, cumulative disadvantage, disproportionate impact, and what I'm calling predictive parity. There are many more ideas about what constitutes justice or fairness that I could have put on this list, and I should say I'm using perhaps sloppily the terms justice and fairness interchangeably. Um, these are meant to be examples only. I'm not saying these ought to be our top four priorities or these are the only things that matter by a long shot. Um, so let me run through my definitions of each. By desert, I mean a standard which holds that virtue ought to be rewarded and vice should be punished. To return to the example of credit-based insurance scores, this would suggest that if you have bad credit because you're irresponsible, then it's fair to raise your insurance prices. But if you have bad credit because you're unlucky, then it's not. In fact, that's exactly what many policymakers effectively argued. With cumulative advantage and disadvantage, I'm getting at the notion that starting advantage should not turn into additional advantage, nor should starting disadvantage turn into additional disadvantage. For example, this seems to be what motivates at least some people to argue that hiring decisions should not be based on criminal histories, that it's wrong for one serious disadvantage to beget another, to continue reverberating through one's life across new domains. This can also work in the other direction with advantage unfairly compounding over time. You hear people lamenting how the rich get richer and, and so on. By disproportionate impact, I mean the idea that certain social groups should receive the same proportions of benefits and burdens. So in the US context, this is often about whether black Americans and white Americans see similar aggregate outcomes or whether men and women do. And by predictive parity, I mean that predictions which lead to allocations should be wrong about different people in the same ways. So here I'm rolling together a lot of different definitions that appear in the algorithmic fairness literature. Uh, for my purposes, a bunch of the distinctions that get made between say, I guess I should say for my purposes here, not necessarily in all my work, um, a bunch of the distinctions that get made between say, predictive validity and balance between false positives and false negatives, don't really matter, uh, at least I don't think they do. Um, for me, what's salient is that all these definitions assume that fairness is something that can be determined by examining the rates at which mathematical predictions are inaccurate across individuals. Okay, note that everything I have on the slide is about distributive justice in that each definition articulates a moral standard for allocating benefits and burdens. What's being allocated might be jobs, loans, prison sentences, speeding tickets, transplanted organs, college educations, or something else. My empirical work focuses on the market allocation of economic goods. 
but here I'm trying to cast a broader net. Um, an important scope condition is that all of these conceptions of justice assume that it's right to give different people different things in the first place. Uh, debates about algorithmic fairness often presume that there's nothing fundamentally corrupt about differentiating among individuals. But of course, in plenty of situations, that's totally the case. Uh, trial by jury isn't just for defendants who deserve it or who are predicted to use it in a particular way. It's for everyone, end of story. Uh, I'm also limiting my discussion to situations in which a decision about who gets what information, who gets what, is based on information uh, decision makers have about individuals. So, for example, a school that allocates seats by lottery is giving different people different things, but it's not differentiating based on the traits or actions of individuals beyond, I suppose, signing up for the lottery in the first place. Okay, here then is uh, my argument in table form. In the first column is each notion of justice. In the second column are some of the key questions people operating under each conception of justice tend to ask in order to decide whether the moral standard has been met. And in the last column is the style of cognition most conducive to adjudicating whether or not that standard has been met, to answering the questions in the second column. You can see that the first two notions of justice are easier to adjudicate with information about people organized into narrative. And the second two notions of justice, I'm claiming, are easier to adjudicate with information about people organized into cases that can be compared. Okay, to start with moral dessert. In the second column, we have, what did this person do? Was the act intentional? Was the person in control of the situation? Does society consider the act to be good or bad? Here we see the importance of mental states, the role of other actors, and broader context and circumstance. Importantly, I can't deserve something by virtue of something that someone else has done. So it's important to know what transpired to make me look the way I do. If I study hard and apply myself at school, then I deserve my good grades, but I don't deserve those grades if I get them because my parents bribe my teacher. So how events unfold over time matters. The same is true of cumulative advantage and disadvantage. In the second column, we have questions such as, what leads people to show up in the data the way they do? Will this decision compound life trajectories? Is this moment a turning point? Here, the sequence of events is key. These concepts imply certain life trajectories. The point isn't that it's wrong to make an unfavorable decision about a person down on his luck, but that it's wrong if that unfavorable decision plays into a broader ongoing arc of ever increasing disadvantage. So to sum up my first two rows, my argument is that narrative is the better way to organize cognition if these are the questions we want to answer. And now for the conceptions of justice that more easily map onto the logic of case comparison. Importantly, both disproportionate impact and what I'm calling predictive parity are statements about forms of equality or inequality, which I'll return to at the end of the talk. For assessing disproportionate impact, relevant questions include, at what rates do various socially meaningful groups of people receive benefits and burdens? Does anything justify differences in those rates? So by socially meaningful groups, I mean groups such as black people, white people, men, women, and so on. Here, you need people rendered as cases because the question is essentially, do cases that are similar on all except for one salient attribute get treated differently? It doesn't matter why any given person has been assigned the attributes they have. What matters is given those attributes, are decisions being made equally across cases? And finally, predictive parity. In the second column we have, do predictions that determine allocations work the same way for all people? Are predictions wrong about some people in novel ways? In the algorithmic fairness literature, uh, this approach is often framed as being about socially meaningful groups, but I'm actually not sure that needs to be the case. Um, after reading some recent work by Debbie Hellman, I started thinking about the following example. If we live in a society with only two criminal defendants, then the standard for convic conviction should either be preponderance of the evidence or beyond a reasonable doubt. What 
would be unfair, would be using one standard for the first defendant and the other standard for the second defendant. So this is still about cases. Each person has been categorized as a criminal rather than as a civil defendant, which is what necessitates their equality of treatment. But the defendant's race, sex, and so on doesn't come into play. Of course, in many real world examples, those things do matter greatly. Um, I'm just pointing out that I don't know that they necessarily have to for there to be concern about fairness in this way. Okay, so where does this leave us? Returning to the overview of my argument, I started out by arguing that case comparative and case comparison that is and narrative represent distinct ways of organizing cognition. I then showed you how each way of organizing cognition makes various features of people more or less legible. I next moved on to how this difference in legibility makes various moral standards more or less easy to adjudicate. And now I'm here, about to argue that this has bearing on debates about algorithmic fairness, because algorithms necessarily work through case comparison which means that some types of unfairness are harder to think in given the form information takes. In fact, I'm going to go one step farther and say that starting a, starting a conversation about algorithmic fairness with algorithms and the data that go into them is inherently limiting. My proposition is that the form information takes shapes our cognition in ways that not only make some definitions of fairness easier to adjudicate, but more salient in the first place. The hitch is that this then crowds out other competing definitions of fairness that rely on other ways of organizing cognition and knowing about individuals. I'll end then on the issue of equality. Based on my not comprehensive reading of the algorithmic fairness literature, I'm a sociologist who tries to keep up with it, but it's not the literature I work in. Um, that's my caveat. Um, it seems to me that equality is often taken as a definitive statement on fairness. Now, I don't want to tell Aristotle his business, treating like cases alike, that's great. Like, I buy into equality. I'm not saying that it doesn't matter. Um, I just don't think that it's the only thing we need to be paying attention to if we're going to truly grapple with the morality of algorithmic decision making. But I get why so much of the literature lands there. Cases and the logic of case comparison organize our thinking in a way that makes equality a very legible notion of justice. Nonetheless, I think it's incumbent upon working in this space, people working in this space, to not let the nature of their tools dictate the nature of their thinking. So the other day, I was reminded of that saying, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, that probably overstates my own position, but it does point in the right direction. Algorithms clearly let us see more than we could otherwise, but they also only let us see certain types of things. So we need to not forget to continue to look in other ways as well. Uh, so thanks so much. That's all I have, and I really look forward to your questions. That was fantastic. Thanks so much, Barbara. Um, uh, it's, okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to have Q&A. I just wanted to say a quick welcome to some friends from the Centre for AI and Digital Ethics at the University of Melbourne um, who are joining us on the panel. So the people who I um, unceremoniously <laughs> transferred from participant to panellist, um, very nice to have you with us. Um, and uh, a few other friends are joining us too. Um, we have an, a nice queue of hands already. Um, the first one I saw go up was Sarita. So Sarita, would you mind starting us off? Um, yeah, sure. Hi. Thanks so much for this talk. Um, so I have a question um, that has to do with where you were where you were going from the sort of conclusion that you just gave. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, um, so you're so as I understood what you were saying, you were talking about this is sort of like this case based logic and this narrative based logic that are um, different ways of sort of understanding fair the fairness in decision making processes. And what you were saying is that like it's, what I heard you saying with this was that the um, narrative based logic was, um, well, while the case based logic is more sort of algorithmically tractable, the uh, narrative one is more nuanced and sort of uh, responsive to the morally salient features, uh, contextual features that people experience. 
And so what you were sort of heading towards, I, I thought perhaps was, and maybe I'm reading too much into this, was that we should try to shift towards framing things in that, um, that way, even if it sort of sacrifices some of that um, algorithmic tractability. Um, and I'm wondering if there's another way of thinking about it, which is having a goal, having as a goal, um, ensuring a kind of intertranslatability between the um, the case-based reasoning and the narrative-based reasoning, so that we can, like, we can continue to sort of use, leverage the 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 sort of computational capabilities of that case-based reasoning while being able to interpret it in a narrative way and criticize it from that lens. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for that question. Um, so it's interesting, sort of the idea of how interoperable are these two like logics of, I guess the way I would think about it is like cases and narrative are like two competing ways of making sense of people that then sort of lend, lend us to sort of more easily see different types of moral arguments. So I guess for me, I think that the, the example I started with, with credit-based insurance scoring was a really good example was in that, um, I mean, not that I'm holding that up as like, this is how policy played out in this setting is what we should try to emulate in other settings. It was largely, it was problematic in other ways, but basically regulators cared about predictive validity. They cared about the sort of moral standard that case-based logic was really good at shedding light on. And then they also cared about moral deservingness for which they had to start reaching for all these like causal narratives about basically why people showed up in the data the way the way they did. So to me, it's perhaps, I really like the direction you're going, but I might just tweak it a little bit and say instead of the two being interoperable that we have multiple moral standards that we think ought to be met in various situations. And to meet some of those moral standards, you know, we need case, the logic of case comparison. And for others, we need, narrative and so we need both not necessarily that we're ever going to be able to um you know reduce them into like some third new thing i think that they might actually be fundamentally at odds um i want to go back and read a lot of like cognitive psychology but like i don't know people think in categories and they think in stories it seems like very fundamental perhaps fundamentally at odds and different and distinct but both very important. Like try to live your life only thinking in categories or only thinking in narratives. I don't think we would function. But thank yeah. you. Yeah. So yeah, I guess basically I'm just a quick follow up here. Um, so I liked the language you were using in terms of like how you're rendering people. You're rendering mm -hmm. them at in categorically or, or in a case based kind of way. And it seems like um, you could think of that as just fundamentally different, like paradigmatically, or you could think of that as a shared like like trying to develop. Uh, one of your goals is trying to develop a shared framework so that they're not different. Yeah, I think there might be like, um, like mathematicians and I presume like computer scientists and engineers like always want elegant solutions, like sort of like, like most reduced form. And I think that ultimately, like, like, you know, figuring out what's fair, I think is a political question, which I think is often like the opposite, like reduced form is super dangerous. Like what you actually need is like constant competing ideas clashing against each other. So that might actually be another way of thinking about um, like the extent to which like interoperability is even de desirable. Um, but thanks, I really appreciate that. And I'm glad to know that the word render wasn't odd or off-putting. I couldn't think of a better one. So I'm gonna, uh, we'll go to a computer scientist next. Um, part of the point of the seminar is to bring all these different disciplinary perspectives together. I just wanted to throw in that I think that the, the recent furore over A-level exam results in the UK is just a, a really, really clear example of the two different types of thing that you're talking about. Um, uh, so in a quite different context, um, but you okay. can read any number of op-eds and they would basically just be perfect grist for your mill. Um, so the next question is gonna be from Michael Yang. Okay. Hi, um, thank you for that great talk. Um, my question is still gonna be about interoperability in some way. So um, uh, I particularly, I think, I, I think Actually, uh, causality um, like is um, one potential way. I think that computer scientists have tried to sort of try yeah. to make things more interoperable. I don't have any love for causal-based definitions of fairness. I probably agree uh, pretty wholeheartedly with one of our early speakers, Lily, Lily Hu, about like like the weird, the probably bad metaphysics of using causal-based notions of fairness to educate between demographic variables. But I mm -hmm. think if there's any benefit to causal reasoning, it should be that it helps people to reason about like the variables, the data that, that we can measure um, mm -hmm. in a more narrative form, right? And on one of your mm -hmm. earlier slides, you uh, explicitly said that you think it, that kind of causality, um, the computer yeah. science version of causality is still pretty case-based and 
yeah, I think I, I maybe disagree. So I'll talk about that. Yeah, I, that's uh, thanks for flagging that. Um, I need to really think that through. I think, like, coming up in sociology, all the statistics class I I took always sort of there was always a very big emphasis on theory is why you build the models the way you do. So for example, you might have variables in your model that wind up not being significant. Do you keep them? It's like, of course you keep them if you had a theoretical reason, like a, you know, like a prior reason to think that this is how the world works. And so I need to think a lot more about that, but I think that there are, yeah, my sense is that they're, that they're distinct, but I don't have a good articulation of how or why yet. But I guess one thing I should have clarified is I don't think that these are, like, I don't think like, like here's someone building algorithms, like they're working, they're in case-based logic, you know, like 24 seven. Like, I think these two things are constantly working with, with each other. Like, I think that you can't, you can't decide to like look for a new sort of variable to put into your algorithm without narrative. Like, why would you have like Googled that to see if there's a data broker that can sell you that data in the first place? You know, like even if like the thing you're producing is operating on the logic of, of cases. So, um, yeah, I guess I'll maybe just sort of say I agree with you that I I have failed to articulate how they're different, and I'll sort of add another problem <laughs> that you did not articulate to my argument, which is they're not actually perhaps like these things that don't constantly appear at the, the same time. So thanks yeah, for that. that I definitely need to think more about, about how to articulate that instinct I have, which comes from my training, that these are like very discreet ways of thinking about about things yeah. being yeah and, and for sure I, I think a lot of the not all of the, like I said I'm not in general a fan of causal based notions and I think some of the attempts to use it to come up with a way of the fairness is like in the reductive yeah. way that you just talked about earlier so I don't think that's helpful but and, yeah. and I'll say one thing like one of the takeaways from that um the paper that I have written um about credit-based insurance scoring which I'll po post to the slack channel after this um is that at least in this case, what policymakers were doing, they weren't looking, they weren't looking for a story that said this variable is causally related, therefore it's legitimate. This one is spurious, therefore it's not legitimate. They were using causal stories in order to adjudicate whether or not something was fair. So like the 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 causal story wasn't the thing determining fairness. It was the tool that was being used in order to adjudicate fairness. So for example, you know, and this is all happening sort of like in this political policy realm. So like one strong narrative was that, you know, irresponsibility is what accounts for this relationship between credit scores and car insurance claims. That if you're irresponsible, you don't manage your financial obligations well, you're lackadaisical about borrowed money, and at the same time, you're reckless in your driving. So that is sort of what's causing, you know, if you think of a DAG, like it's simultaneously causing both of these things. And a lot of policymakers are like, okay, well, if that's the story, that's great. But then this competing causal story of, okay, but what if it's not responsibility? What if it's income? Because really what's being measured isn't car accidents, but insurance claims. And so people who are rich who get into accidents probably don't file claims because at least in the U.S. context, their rates will go up the following year. Like your insurance broker tells you don't file small claims. So there you have, instead of, you know, responsibility sort of causing this connection between scores and claims, you have income. So in that case, policymakers were like, well, that's not legitimate. If that's, if that's what's causing those two things. So in both cases, they were sort of willing to agree like, yes, this is, these are like both plausibly plausibly causal, but one causal story sort of passed their like moral standard of, you know, dessert and the other didn't. Okay, so I'm going to keep the disciplinary um, cycling going and we're going to go to law now. So um, Jeannie Patterson, who's the director of the Centre for AI and Digital Ethics, co-director of Centre AI and Digital Ethics at the University of Melbourne. Jeannie. Thanks, Seth. And um, thank you so much for this talk, Barbara. It was um, incredibly interesting and I'd, I'd really like to read your paper in fact so I'm looking forward to that. Um, so listening to you um, I had two thoughts from a sort of legal perspective and one was I think in law this distinction you're talking about case-based fairness and um, uh, moral deservingness or actuarial fairness and moral deservingness we would talk about in terms of procedural fairness I uh -huh. think, um, and there's other lawyers in the crowd who might correct me, which is the idea that you 
that the fairness is about having the same process for everybody, uh -huh. even though their underlying circumstances may be different, but you have the same process and therefore that's your definition of fairness. And substantive fairness is where you take the narrative into account uh -huh. and in particularly look at just desserts. So that's that sort of relationship between those two aspects of fairness is something that we grapple with a lot, yeah. particularly in the field of credit, in fact, because, and this was my question to you, how much does the institutional factors play a role here? Because from the perspective of the insurer, I don't actually think they're interested in fairness, they're interested in risk, credit risk, and therefore, actuarial fairness is, is what resonates for what they're doing and for their processes and the way they can operationalise yeah. the process. And that's very analogous to the doctors who need a process they can follow. Mm -hmm. And the fact that sometimes you get it wrong in terms of moral deservingness is almost um, part of the institutional arrangement because in most cases you'll get it right and in most cases you've got this element of replicating replicability which also goes to the institution's concept of fairness totally yeah no thanks for that question um yeah so i mean much of my work even though you probably don't sort of pick up from here is like i think that fair like coming at it as a sociologist like fairness standards are never sort of things that exist in the abstract they're always sort of like embedded in certain types of institutional arrangements or go with certain actors that have lots of different motivations for arguing that this is the right standard of fairness, or even that this is a standard of fairness in the first place. I mean, like predictive validity, which is essentially actuarial fairness, if it predicts it's fair, like I have definitely conversations, you know, with like philosophers who are like, that's not, a, that doesn't fit into the category of fairness. Like that's, that's sort of like a corrupt understanding, but, but I think it's very, um, intentional that it gets framed as a type of fairness, like for like, rhetorical power like in these in these realms so i think um at least in the you know in the us um i think that i mean my my experience with like talking to companies both in insurance and also in credit scoring they actually do really care about like how people perceive things as fair but because they don't want to wind up on the front page of the wall street journal when someone finds out you know like oh look target's predicting whether or not you're pregnant you know which totally blindsided them right so like they actually do really want to have like some sense it doesn't mean that they're trying to like enact a fair society in their corporation and i don't know that that's sort of the standard we should be be holding them to but i definitely take take your point that 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 idea like as a standard of fairness is being um articulated by an actor that might you know sort of be and i don't want to say that they don't care about like what's good and right like i think that you know i think the idea that like our main purpose is to to like make money for shareholders gets internalized as an idea about like what's good and, and right um as well but but i definitely take take your point in terms of like the procedural distributive justice i hadn't really thought about it that way but i should I should think about that. I think, more. I think I'm not even saying that corporations are cynical or insurance companies are cynical. I'm saying that they have to process many, many claims. And as soon as you start bringing in a narrative about just desserts, you're putting a lot of discretion on individual players. From an institutional perspective, it's very hard to operationalise and can in fact lead to yeah. more unfairness from an institutional perspective because you don't, you're not, you may run into a situation where you're not, you can't operationalise treating like cases alike. I'm not saying that that's yeah. correct, but that's the, th that I think is a driver for this very <laughs> sort of formal approach. I yeah, I, I, think, I think there are some ways and you can, it's certainly not perfect. Like I have other work about how employers in the US, employers use credit reports to making hiring decisions. And some companies, a lot of this happens at the back end, so it's sort of all within the realm of like discretion and storytelling. But some companies do sort of screen up front, but they'll like write in rules, like, you know, like in the credit data, don't count collections that are coded as medical. So like they do write in some sorts of moral exceptions, but I definitely take your take your point that sort of like that level of discretion is is tough to scale up, which is which is one thing I try to point out in the beginning is like it's not incidental. You know, it's like, oh well, oh, people are real people they realize there's all this complication you just turn them into cases you just turn them it's like yeah great well do you want like modern capitalism at all any semblance of it like you have to do that like if you want credit scoring people are gonna have to be cases like it's like a lot of the systems that that we know and love that are deeply flawed and imperfect like we wouldn't get to have it all if you like we're always insisting on well I want to know the story of every single person 
Anyway, thank you so much. But I loved the way you unpacked all the different ways we may look at the more substantive questions. I think yeah. it was tremendously useful um, thank for you. this conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you. Just on that last point again, I keep thinking of the A-levels thing. Um, the the yeah. alternative that they've gone back to is individual teachers predicting students' um, scores. Um, and, you know, if you've, got, <laughs> if you've got a bit of a shit as your teacher, then right. you probably were quite excited about the algorithm, you know? And I think, um, yeah. And I, I think this is like why, like, more important than anything, we need to build mechanisms into society to keep having these debates. Because at the end of the day, like, I don't think that there's a perfect solution to this that we just need to, like, rationalize our way into. Like, I think part of the point is we constantly need to be having very public fights about what fairness means because, you know, people have competing ideas. And in my own head, like, I'll cycle through, you know, even about the same situation. Like, I can see this, I can see that. So I think like, having it be, be public. So to your point about procedure, it's actually, for this paper about credit-based insurance scores, I forget how many, 10,000 pages, which was not even like a drop in the bucket of what exists about public policy debate on this topic. But the only reason why it even happened is that in 1970, the U.S. passed a law, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, that said if you give someone something different, a different loan, a different insurance policy, a different job, or you deny them those things because of their credit data, you have to tell them. So there was this mechanism mechanism that was asleep all those years waiting for this moment so that when insurance companies started using credit scoring at scale, people started getting these letters in the mail saying Fair Credit Reporting Act, you know, notification, your insurance rates are going up because of your credit score. And those people called their insurance state insurance departments, which had consumer complaint lines. So we also need consumer complaint lines broadly. And then it turned into a public policy issue. Like it, it, the issue itself was only visible because of all these sort of like pre-existing procedures that that um, existed that like let the debate bubble up. So in a way, I think maybe like the point we are at history, it's more important to build structures to enable debate than it is to have particular debates right now, if that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, okay, so I'm going to go to one of the questions from the Q&A and I just uh, I'm seeing a lot of good stuff going up in the chat. We'll try and make sure that we copy the chat over to the Slack so we keep it after the um, yeah, broadcast closes. Um, so a question from Momin Malik um, in the US. Um, so this sort of draws a little bit on some some things that you were asking, uh, you were talking about in your response to Sarita, but um, maybe there's more to say. So he writes, from what I see in machine learning, it's not just that people trained in case comparison reject narrative, but they don't even recognize that narrative forms of organizing cognition are possible. Do you have thoughts about how to make it intelligible, uh, not necessarily through intellectual argument alone, perhaps rhetorical techniques or even community building? Yeah, yeah, it, that's a great question. I think, I think there's something about um, like how different, well, I don't want to knock professions. Like we live in sort of an era of, a certain type of calculative rationality. So I think that, I think, I think people, do, if they sort of stop and reflect like on their own thinking, they will quickly realize like, oh, I'm constantly morally reasoning, reasoning in narrative as well, just like with like a N of one. Um, but I think that what's maybe difficult is sort of seeing that as like valid, like a valid sort of evidence, which I think is because it isn't just about like, scientific professions, it might be a little bit about that and certain types of knowledge, you know, being seen as, you know, legitimate to the exclusion of other sorts of knowledge. Um, but, but I think it's also sort of the, the point at which we are in the evolution of our society that certain types of, um, you know, especially like quantitative case-based knowledge are sort of given um, more legitimacy in terms of like knowledge claims. Like I think there's a sociology of knowledge that's operating in the background as well. Um, so yeah, in terms of getting people to realize that, like I think, I mean, it might be interesting to start like just like through introspection because I think that it's it's really difficult <laughs> to make decisions about what's right. And it's like, like why, like, why do we care about disparate impacts with white people and black people? Like, explain to me why that, and I would argue we care deeply as we should about that because of history, <laughs> because of how events unfolded over time, because of the crimes that unfolded over time against this part of the population. Like, why do we care about 
that particular type of inequality in the first place, I think, relies on a narrative understanding of, you know, how these two groups have been treated in society over the centuries. Okay, so we're going to rotate back to philosophy now. We've got a question from Claire Bennett. Hi, thanks, Barbara. Um, I was wondering, uh, given that I assume um, sometimes these different conceptions of fairness are going to be um, not multiply realizable, like how do we work out which ones we should be prioritizing and how do we trade them off against each other? And do you think that it's like the answer to that will be because certain kinds of case studies, like cases, lend not certain times of problems uh, lend themselves to particular types of thinking like different types of thinking are appropriate in terms of case comparison or narrative or do you think that different kinds of fairness are going to be appropriate and thus we need to develop systems that prioritize the kind of um thinking that aligns yeah. with that kind of fairness yeah, so this is definitely stepping far outside of my lane. Um, I study how other, how people, <laughs> how ideas about fairness, especially market fairness, get institutionalized. Um, not so much like what what's fair in this case. Um, I I'll like sound probably like a first year like PhD doctoral student. I read this book by Michael Walzer about spheres of justice, and that seems so smart to me. Um, I don't. I mean, I think like a lot of like the like Helen Nissenbaum stuff is sort of inspired by that and the privacy, you know, like I don't, it, it feels right to me, like intuitively that like different domains of social life run on their own logics in lots of different ways. Um, in, in sociologists, in sociology, um, there's this great, but like unreadable book called On Justification by these two French scholars, uh, Boltanski and Thevenot, that sort of gets at the same, there's a whole like institutional logics literature that sort of gets at the same thing that, you know, like how you think and part of how you think and like what you value within the domain of like religion or the family or Christianity or capitalism or democracy are like fundamentally different and incompatible. So um, I don't think I have a good, a good answer. I sort of feel like that's why I always want to talk to philosophers is like, I don't know, how do you decide against like competing, um, you know, moral standards? How do you know that this is a moment for, you know, equality and this is a moment for, um, you know, you know, how, yeah, how do you know <laughs> that it's not like I can treat two people like in really crappy ways, but if I treat them equally in crappy ways, like that doesn't seem right. But I don't, I don't have, I think, like the, the language for articulating like when you would realize those those distinctions yeah I don't know that, that we philosophers do either we just uh, <laughs> don't let that, let stop us <laughs> um, okay Leshin from computer science oh, um, thanks for a fascinating talk Barbara I have um, right basically there's um, in the distinction between cases and narratives in general, um, from example, the big table you presented, right? So for us who work with data, it seems that one of the distinctions is that um, cases can be seen as a form of data reduction, where narrative is basically all the relevant bits of information combined. Um, I, yeah, I don't know if there is any useful um, sort of outlet from that and how we should do. And the other observation is, uh, which was a parent your baby's example, but also in the legislature, in that it seems another distinction in the outcome of how people deal with them is that narratives elicit emotions, but cases don't. Or I'm sorry. Uh, so You're treating not. something as I'm sorry, treating something as cases is deliberately abstracting away from emotion, mm -hmm. but narrative is sort of the opposite, where almost the goal is to elicit other people's emotional involvement so that they agree yeah. with you on what well, on the bill. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. And it's interesting to hear you talk about cases as data reduction. Cases definitely reduce data, but you're still selecting detail and narrative. Like, I don't think that the difference is like 
cases are, I mean, in a way it's like cases are thinner than narrative, but it's just, it, you're selecting on different sorts of detail. Um, I think that's what, and then sometimes the detail works, like the point about like what's important in a story is often emergent. Like in cases, it's like, well, what do you, what do you want to know? What, you know, what data do we collect? You know, it's very like, let's start at the top and go to the bottom, whereas narrative, you often don't know to the end. So I think there are differences beyond like the sorts of details that are important to pay attention to, but that's definitely part of it. But hearing you sort of talk about the data reduction, this is maybe like a good example of how like they, like a logic of case and narrative, they, they intertwine all the time. Like, so for example, like what about like genres in narrative? Like this is like, mystery, you know, this is romance, this is um, man versus nature, this is nature versus nature. I mean, that is an act of classification. That is like taking narratives and putting them into cases. Um, so I think that those are narratives, you know, hiding within sort of like a taxonomy that would be, you know, easy to like manipulate, like through processes of case comparison. So in a way, it's, Maybe it's it's like the the level of detail and how you know what's important to pay attention to is what is what varies. Um, because I don't I, like I like cases, you know. Like I'm not against cases. I like having bureaucracies. I like having statistics. These are good, useful things. Um, so yeah, I guess I want to try to not be. I don't want to make it seem like oh, cases are just like lesser in some way um, because I, I think they're actually more different. I feel, well, again, the data reduction of language cases are explicit data reduction, but narratives yeah. are varying. <laughs> like exactly. Them. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think that we won't, don't have quite time for a last question. So I think we'll, we'll stop there. Um, so before, we, before I summarily end this broadcast and we all sort of disappear, I um, uh, absolutely want to say thank you so much to Barbara for a wonderful talk and for fielding those questions. And it was great to have questions coming from all of these different um, different angles uh, and you dealt with them all um, beautifully. Um, and we're going to go over to the, the Slack now. Um, what I would love um, for Michael to do, if you don't mind, can you, are you able to copy the chat over? There have been loads of resources. Thanks in particular to, to Momin for um, all of the references that have gone up there. Um, they've been super. Hopefully you'll go over to the Slack um, and keep the discussion going there.